Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome for tuning in. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this session um, around uh, detecting attacks against proof of work. Um, we'll be talking about this for the next 25 minutes or so. And uh, we is uh, myself. My name is uh, Gert Jaap. I work uh, with MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. And uh, my primary focus for the past 11 months or so has been uh, a project called Pool Detective, which we'll be detailing more in uh, the coming presentation. Um, uh, with me today is James Lovejoy. James recently graduated from MIT, and he did his master's thesis with uh, the Digital Currency Initiative as well um, on uh, the reorg tracker, which he'll be talking about in just a minute. Um, so let me introduce the Digital Currency Initiative real quick. Uh, we're a research group uh, based out of the MIT Media Lab, and there's three things that we do. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, we're um, uh, attached to universities, so we're educators. Uh, we try to build um, capacity in this industry by teaching courses and also advising our students on, on these topics. Um, we're also conducting research, uh, so we contribute research and open source uh, development addressing some of the problems that are still in the blockchain space uh, around scalability, privacy, and also, uh, and that's the topic of this talk, security. Uh, and obviously having a strong brand and a history of standard setting and a neutral platform are also good uh, conveners. Um, so let's uh, introduce the topics that we're going to cover uh, today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, James, who's going to introduce you to uh, the reorg tracker, which is a system that uh, detects chain reorganizations and double spends. Um, and then uh, it's my turn to talk to you about pool detective and what pool detective is and does, uh, is it records and analyzes the behavior of cryptocurrency mining pools. So first off, we're going to hand it off to James to talk you through the reorg tracker. James. Okay, thanks, Matt. Yeah. Uh, so what we're talking about today uh, is the real tracker, which was my master's thesis project this last year at the DCI. Um, what it's dealing with is studying 51% attacks. Now, proof of work has been around as a consensus algorithm for just over 10 years now, uh, first used in Bitcoin, uh, but now used in uh, many of the coins uh, across the industry. And if you read Satoshi's white paper, uh, his security argument uh, is pretty hand wavy. He essentially says that, you know, 51% attacks should be impractical and really a miner should not want to do it. But more recently, economic researchers have been looking into, well, if we take miners from a rational economic perspective, you know, is that really true? And ultimately the current theory says that actually, you know, 51% attacks should be far from impossible. Uh, it says that they should be cheap. Uh, and it comes down to this theory from uh, microeconomics, which states that uh, at market equilibrium, uh, the marginal cost becomes equal to the marginal revenue. And what this means for proof of work is that the cost of a reorg uh, should equal the value of the block rewards for doing that reorg. So at market equilibrium, hash rate is abundant and minor profit is eliminated meaning that an adversary could break even uh, without even having to double spend. And this was introduced in actually three separate papers, one by Eric Budish, uh, one by uh, Hasu and a few others, and one by uh, Raphael Auer. So naturally we wanted to study these because we wanted to see, you know, how does the theory uh, hold up in practice? And it seems that, you know, for coins with a very small network hash rate, there's actually plenty of hash rate available for run. This is because lots of coins share mining algorithms. So if there's a large coin uh, and then several smaller coins, often only a very small percentage of the network hash rate has to shift uh, from one coin to another in order to be 51% or even 100% of that network's hash rate. Uh, additionally, sort of new players in the game, such as NiceHash, have created a rental market, meaning that it's actually possible for an adversary or anyone to only have to pay the marginal cost of their hash rate. They don't have to worry about the fixed costs or maintaining mining hardware, making attacking far more practical. And coins have been attacked in practice and money has been stolen. 
uh, and this is sort of an excerpt from some of the news articles that came out before we performed this research, suggesting that a number of coins, you know, Bitcoin, Verge, Ethereum Classic, Bitcoin Gold, uh, have all been 51% attacked. Uh, one of these articles even calls the 51% attack rare. So we wanted to see, you know, how true is this? Uh, are they rare or not? So which coins actually exist in a liquid hash rate market? Uh, it turns out quite a lot. Uh, over half of the coins that we studied are actually existing in such a market right now, where the black, the black line, line in the middle represents 100% uh, of that coin's network hash rate. So for more than 50% of the coins, uh, there's far more than 100% of their network hash rate available for rent on nice hash. And in the worst case, with Expanse, you know, there's over a thousand times that coin's network hash rate available for rent at any one time. So why do we need a real tracker? Uh, well, these events, they're transient. So people often say, well, you know, can't you see the attack in the blockchain? And the answer is no. You know, you need a, an active observer to be monitoring the network to check whether or not an attack occurs. Uh, also, up until now, we've been reliant on victims to tell us about whether they've been attacked. And as you can imagine, you know, if this results in insolvency or a loss of user funds, victims are often not super interested in revealing an attack has taken place. We also wanted to see if we can demonstrate that 51% attacks are a real risk to the market and quantify how much these attacks cost and try and calculate realistic confirmation requirements that exchanges should be using for these coins. We also wanted to investigate whether there are any mitigation strategies that coins could use to try and protect themselves against attacks. So what are we detecting here? Uh, in the normal operation of a blockchain, uh, the subsequent blocks refer to a single previous block and the chain is extended contiguously. But in the case of a reorg, one set of blocks uh, and another set of blocks both reference the same fork block and one set of blocks can be replaced by the other when uh, one set of blocks has a higher total work than the other one. So what an attacker might want to do is include a transaction in the original set of blocks that deposits to an exchange. Then once that exchange has credited the deposit, they re reveal a second set of blocks that replaces their deposit transaction uh, and in fact makes it invalid such that the exchange cannot later include that deposit transaction in subsequent blocks. So the attacker is able to keep both their deposit and whatever coins they had on the exchange, which they can then withdraw um, or exchange for coins. So what did we do? Uh, we ran coin demons for 21 different proof-of-work cryptocurrencies. Uh, and we also tracked Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, for which we used remote APIs. And then we tracked reorgs on each of these coins for a period of 10 months, and then correlated the attack events we discovered with market data from NiceHash and price data from CryptoCompare. So this is a block diagram of our system design. Essentially what we had is uh, all of the coin demons or web APIs for the different coins responsible for talking to those coins peer-to-peer -peer networks, and then tracker processes for each of the coins which uh, determined whether or not uh, a reorg was taking place. And if a reorg had taken place, it saved both the original set of blocks, uh, the replacement set of blocks, and the fork block to a database for later analysis for double spent transactions. So what did we find? Well, we found that uh, attacks do certainly happen. And in the worst case on Vertcoin, uh, we detected an attack that was 600 blocks deep. Uh, which is the equivalent of over 24 hours worth of blocks being removed uh, from the, the primary chain, uh, which, as you can imagine, is pretty catastrophic, and lots more than the six blocks that most people tend to think about when they think about Bitcoin, at least. Additionally, we were able to compare uh, does the marginal cost actually equal marginal revenue in practice? And what we found is at least within sort of one order of magnitude, that certainly seems to be the case. And that, you know, using the block reward as a proxy for the cost of a reorg seems to be uh, a pretty accurate estimation. Uh, there are certainly some outliers which can be explained, but that's out of the scope of this talk. So in terms of, you know, the attacks we discovered, we detected attacks on a number of different coins, which included double spends. 
as you can see, the sort of deepest reorg there is sort of 25 hours worth of blocks being removed on Bitcoin. As well as on Bitcoin Gold, you can see the cumulative amount of double spent value reaching over half a million dollars in the end. So uh, certainly a significant amount of money is at stake here. Additionally, we found strong evidence that nice hash is being used uh, by adversaries to launch attacks. We were actually forewarned of the attack on Bitcoin before it was deployed because a miner discovered that they were being provided work by nice hash uh, to mine on Bitcoin for secret blocks. And additionally, when we observed the market conditions on nice hash during the time of the attack, we found that there was a pretty large spike in available hash rate capacity as well as price coinciding with the start of the attack uh, and the end of the attack, i.e. when we believe the attack was starting to be generated and when the end of the attack um, was deployed, i.e. the blocks were revealed to the network. Additionally, we discovered counterattacks. So the uh, deep reorgs that occurred on Bitcoin Gold included repeated counterattacks. So what happens is uh, a defender, after the attacker had revealed their blocks, showed up and extended the original fork to displace the attacker's fork. The adversary then responded by extending their malicious fork to once again restore their malicious fork to the primary chain. And finally, the defender once again extended the original fork, restoring the original fork to the primary chain uh, and thwarting the attack. And this confirms a theory that was developed uh, at the DCI by a Harvard student, Dan Moroz, uh, that states that counterattacks really should deter attacking in the first place once there's a credible threat uh, of a counterattack. We also looked into how asset prices change uh, after an attack. There's a lot of folklore in the space that suggests that you know, post-attack, it would be catastrophic for the coin's reputation, and thus the price of that coin would decrease significantly. But we found that often that's not the case, or at least it's not the case within a short period of time after the attack, at least giving the attacker enough time to uh, withdraw their funds and make a profit on their attack. In fact, for one of the attacks on Expanse, the attack coincided with a large exchange pump where the price of that asset increased over seven times, meaning that the attack was incredibly profitable uh, for the attacker, even without including any double spends. So in terms of future work, uh, it would be really great to deploy the real tracker as a commercial product. Right now, uh, it's just a research tool. It's not really suitable for um, sort of mass usage, but clearly, given that these attacks are becoming more and more frequent and lots of money is at stake, it's clearly required that some kind of monitoring is, is needed. Additionally, we don't know who the attacker and the victims were, so it's important to try and find that out because if it's exchanges that are being attacked and they're losing user funds, it's important for users to be aware of that. Secondly, we need to be able to interpret state changes between forks and account-based coins. Uh, it's Assuming an attack one day happens on an account-based coin, there are a lot more complex interactions between different contracts, so it's much harder than just seeing which outputs are double spent between different coins. And finally, given that we've seen that counter-attacking is potentially a, uh, a method to sort of uh, prevent, prevent these attacks from occurring, we want to be able to implement an automated counter-attack system for vulnerable coins so that they can defend themselves in the event of an attack. Thanks, over to her, yeah. Thanks, James. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, the pool detective. Uh, and before we start to talk about pool detective, let's talk about uh, pool mining. So uh, when you buy a state-of-the-art uh, Bitcoin miner, uh, the beauty of the Bitcoin network is that you can um, uh, run a Bitcoin full node, um, install a little bit of software, and then uh, be mining on the Bitcoin blockchain all by yourself. Um, now, the problem with this approach, however, is that uh, due to the vast amount of computational capacity that the Bitcoin network currently has, um, your state-of-the-art Bitcoin miner 
will probably take somewhere between 20 and 30 years uh, to find a block. Um, all of which time you'll have to like pay the electric bill for running the miner. And so um, this is a real problem for miners, which they solved uh, by introducing mining pools. Um, and what mining pools do is they distribute the work that needs to be done to find a block um, over a large population of miners that therewith share in the workload. But once the mining pool has found a valid proof of work, uh, they also share in the rewards. So what a mining pool does for a miner is instead of waiting really long for a really big payout, they receive very small payouts much more frequently. Um, and so it reduces the variance of the rewards. And what the pool does in this perspective is they coordinate the work, meaning that they will ensure that no two miners do the same work because that's obviously wasteful. Um, and once the block reward is received, the mining pool will custody that reward um, and will then account for which miner did which amount of work and distribute the rewards based on each of the miners' individual contribution to the total pool resources. And uh, these mining pools communicate with uh, miners using a protocol that is called a stratum. Now to illustrate uh, the power that mining pools have, I'm going to show you this uh, pie chart that shows the distribution uh, of hash rate amongst pools. And what you can see here is that uh, the eight largest pools on the Bitcoin network control 80% of the hash power that is active on the network. Um, and so that means that eight entities, be it persons or companies, uh, control what 80% of all these mining hardware um, is, is working on. And that gives them uh, a fairly serious amount of control. Um, because mining hardware is really, really efficient at um, running proof of work functions. So doing uh, hash functions really efficiently, uh, cranking out as much of these proof of work functions as possible for the lowest amount of energy possible. Uh, but what these devices cannot do is validate whether the work they receive is actually the work that they want to work on. So they cannot do any analysis on uh, the work they receive. And that's a problem uh, in the sense that this risks the mining hardware uh, doing whatever the mining pool tells it to do. So if the mining pool gives the miner work that it doesn't expect, then the mining hardware is going to execute that job regardless. Um, and so what Pool Detective aims to do, and we started this project about uh, 11 months ago, is we're positioning ourselves between the pool and the mining hardware, and we record what the mining pool is telling the miner. Uh, at the same time, we also position ourselves in the peer-to-peer -peer network of the cryptocurrencies that we monitor in order to see uh, the moment at which new blocks are found by listening to the peers announce blocks to each other. Um, and then we store all this data in a large database and we analyze this data for unexpected behavior. And when I talk about unexpected behavior, um, what we look for are these five things that we set out when we started the project. Um, first of all, uh, we look for evidence of selfish mining. And in selfish mining, a mining pool will tell um, the miners that are mining on that pool about a block that they found, and they will start looking for the next block. Uh, but they will not announce the same block to the other peers. And the problem there is that uh, the mining pool will have an unfair advantage in finding the next block because essentially he has a monopoly uh, on that, uh, given that he's the only one knowing about the block. And research shows that this gives the mining pool a unfair advantage, uh, making them receive more rewards than they would when they would be mining honestly. Um, so we want to look for evidence of this. Um, and so far we haven't found any evidence of this, but we're still, we're still looking. Another thing is 
because the device is the mining hardware is in, incapable of determining whether uh, the work it receives is um, of a valid chain, uh, of the chain it expects, um, a mining pool can send work for another chain that uses the same proof of work function. For instance, uh, if you're mining on a Bitcoin pool, uh, you could receive work for Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV and your mining hardware will simply execute it because there's no way for the mining hardware to tell that that's happening. And we found one instance, we found one pool that is sending us Bitcoin Cash and SV work when we expected Bitcoin work. Uh, we're currently uh, waiting for that pool to respond to our findings and then we're going to make a publication about this somewhere in the, in the next few weeks. Um, Another thing that mining pools can do is uh, once they switch from one block to the other, uh, the first thing that they can do that they're sure is valid is mining a empty block on top of the one that another pool found. So before they have been able to validate the block, they can mine an empty block. The problem is if they do this for too long, the risk of finding an empty block is higher, meaning that the total average throughput of the network will decrease because an empty block takes out potential transaction capacity. Um, and so we want, to, um, we want to compare how empty blocks uh, are being served as work by the different pools, whether they all do it the same way, uh, whether uh, pools are really slow in switching from an empty block to a full block, uh, but it's still going on. Uh, another, a little bit more out there is um, mining pools uh, are able to um, uh, conceal their true hash rate by uh, sending miners work for a block that pays to an unknown address. So the pie chart that I showed earlier attributes blocks to mining pools by looking at which address they pay out to, or for instance, marker data somewhere in the reward transaction. And uh, a mining pool could simply use a different payout address that is unknown, uh, meaning that the mining pools hash rate for that part of the work will show up as unknown, um, meaning that nobody's able to tell what their true hash rate is. Um, because mining pools are meant to not have a too large share of the network, while at the same time having a higher share means higher uh, income for the pool. Uh, so it might be a possibility that they're doing this, so we're, we're looking for that. The last one um, is about underpaying miners, so if you send a particular amount of work, you expect a particular amount of payout. Uh, but so far we've concluded that it's hard to determine whether uh, mining pools underpay miners because you need more data than the data that we have observed. We, you need the data that the mining pool has about the other miners. Uh, and so, so far we haven't been able to draw any conclusions on that front. Um, so very, very basic how the system is designed. The core of the system is a reverse stratum proxy where um, instead of having one pool and you distribute the work to multiple miners, which would be a normal stratum proxy, um, you can, uh, it's a reverse proxy where we connect to a bunch of upstream pools and we distribute the work to a single uh, miner that we have. Uh, and so we have a single miner for each of the algorithms that we monitor and we uh, make it do the work of multiple pools at the same time. Uh, another thing that we have is uh, a modified full node software that allows us to monitor what happens on the peer-to-peer -peer network in terms of uh, block propagation. Uh, so we can see when blocks are discovered and we can see when uh, the work uh, to build on top of that block is received so we can detect things like uh, selfish mining. Um, in order to detect when blocks are found more accurately, we're also running this software on five different places uh, on the globe. Uh, to make sure that we're close and connected to uh, the full nodes that find the blocks or are close to the full nodes that find the blocks, meaning that we're learning about the blocks as fast as we can. Now, the system has been running since November 1st. Uh, we're currently monitoring 31 pools on 11 cryptocurrencies. This number is ever increasing. So we're looking at you know, which pools are important in certain currencies and we're adding new pools as we go. Um, these are the pools that we're monitoring for Bitcoin, which covers about 92% of the Bitcoin hash rate, uh, which is significant and important to have a large share in that. Uh, there's 10 altcoins. Also here, there are coins that share the proof of work algorithm, uh, which might allow us to uncover when pools send uh, wrong but compatible work. Um, 
And another aspect is um, including rental markets. So what James said around um, rental markets being used for attacks, if we mine on the rental markets as well, we can uh, see the work on blocks that ends up in an attacker chain and combined with the price data, that would be a smoking gun to these markets being used for uh, attacks. So currently we're analyzing for selfish mining, uh, the timing of empty blocks and whether we can relate work to blocks reliably without having to rely on a known list of addresses per pool. And we're also building an API to expose this data uh, to the public uh, for other people to build on. Uh, so the next steps for us are, we're going to expand this API. Uh, we'll be releasing a blog post soon to introduce this project in more detail, which you can, which you can obviously read more about it. Uh, we're releasing a YouTube video on the Pool Detective to explain it in more detail. Um, and uh, maybe we're releasing also a public front end for people to explore this data. Now, if you want to learn more about the Pool Detective or the Reorg Tracker, you can visit the website uh, of the DCI, which is dci.mit.edu. Also, if you want to learn more about the DCI in general, that's a great place to start. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter, either the DCI account or uh, me personally or James personally. And with that, uh, we're wrapping up. So thank you for watching this uh, presentation. If you want to learn more, um, please feel free to visit the website or contact us on Twitter. Thank you.